Good evening. Uh, welcome to another seminar about long-term thinking sponsored by the Long Now Foundation. My name is Stuart Brand. Phil Tetlock has uh, anticipated something Long Now has wanted to do by about 100 years. We have a site called longbets.org where uh, people register predictions right out in public. And uh, people vote on them and they uh, some people bet money against them, and it's all very conspicuous. And the idea is to develop an idea over 100 years or so as to who's actually good at predicting and who's quite bad and what kinds of predictions uh, hold up and are worth spend, spending your time paying attention to and what kinds are, are worthless. Well, Phil Tellock jumped all that by just uh, going ahead and doing the research on existing predictions by experts and finding out what sifted out from that. And he's got, I think, one of the fundamental ideas about long-term thinking, especially as it applies to taking responsibility for what might happen soon in the future. Please welcome Philip Tetlock. Thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, my topic today is good political judgment, and it is a sign of the power of politics to fog our thinking that there is vastly more controversy surrounding the concept of good political judgment than there is surrounding the concepts of, say, good medical judgment, or good engineering judgment, or good financial judgment. Uh, the vast majority of intelligent people feel that there are reasonably solid benchmarks, gold standards, as it were, for assessing good medical judgment. Uh, patients either do well or they do poorly and even die. Bridges either stand or they fall. Uh, your portfolio either grows or it, or it dwindles. Uh, by contrast, uh, good medical judgment feels to most people uh, hopelessly subjective. You really don't expect Nancy Pelosi and George W. Bush to agree, and you certainly expect in the international scene to observe dramatic differences in how uh, the Iranian leadership looks at good judgment, or how Osama bin Laden views it, or Kim Jong-il, or Vladimir Putin. Uh, so my first task in this talk is to persuade you that the concept of good political judgment is not hopelessly subjective, that it is possible to construct some reasonably objective benchmarks uh, I call them trans-ideological benchmarks, benchmarks that experts from a wide range of ideological and theoretical orientations can at least grudgingly accept. Uh, and it's possible to learn a lot from applying these benchmarks uh, for the purpose of assessing the judgmental accuracy of political experts. Um, Now, there are two big categories of benchmarks of good judgment that we use. There are knowledge indicators and meta-knowledge indicators. So we're interested both in whether experts get it right or wrong, and we're also interested in the degree to which experts assign realistic subjective probabilities to their predictions. So the degree to which experts know something about what they know and don't know. So you do you know what you do and do not know, and I'm going to argue that there's really only one way to find out, and that is to get in the habit of keeping score on one's own judgmental accuracy. And it requires doing something rather cognitively unnatural, I think, and I'm speaking now as a psychologist because my disciplinary background is that of a psychologist. Um, it's not an altogether natural mental act to screw one's own mental processes that way. I'll give you a quick example of what, it, what it's like uh, to scrutinize one's mental processes. And I'm going to use some non-political examples initially, uh, but we'll slip quickly into political ones. Uh, this is a subjective probability scale where people have a dichotomous choice. There, uh, there are only two possible answers. Uh, so a 50% probability represents, of course, maximum uncertainty, coin toss uncertainty. 100% probability represents complete confidence that you're right. And uh, when it, the research that I'm doing, I, I started doing in the 1980s, and I, I was uh, then pretty much exclusively an experimental psychologist. And there was a large body of work in experimental psychology already on um, confidence and confidence calibration, measuring how realistically people could judge states of knowledge. 
And th these involved constructing rather elaborate tests and exercises in which people were asked questions like this about um, isotopes or um, the next question, uh, France uh, being uh, larger in area than Spain. And we're interested both in the accuracy of your answer and we're interested in the accuracy of your subjective probability assessment. And you might ask, well, how would you assess the accuracy of subjective probabilities? Uh, you know, we, and and um, I'll answer that. Uh, there, there are two fundamental ways to do that. Uh, one is called calibration. It's the ability to assign subjective probabilities to outcomes that correspond to their objective probabilities. Now, to do that, you need to get people to take rather long and elaborate tests. You need to get them to make a lot of predictions. And one of the things I was successful in doing was in getting some um, very thoughtful people to sit down and make a lot of different predictions. Um, now, you're well calibrated if, when you say there's a 70% chance of something happening, the things that you assign that 70% likelihood to occur about 70% of the time. And you're well calibrated if when you say 100% probability, the thing always happens. You say 50%, it only happens 50%. So there's a rough correspondence between subjective and objective probabilities. And those of you who have some statistical background will know that this is a somewhat noisy measurement process. So you need to make the law of large numbers work for you. You need to get a lot of predictions to make this to, to, make, to, to make the results um, reasonably reliable. And, and in fact, in the research I'm going to be talking about, it's based, uh, mo most, most of the analyses are based on approximately 28,000 predictions over a roughly 15 year period. Uh, so calibration is one aspect of the accuracy of subjective probability judgments. Discrimination is the other key aspect I'm going to talk about today. And that's your ability to assign sharply higher probabilities to things that happen and to things that don't happen. Now your perfect calibration score is going to look like zero because there's, there's no gap between subjective and objective probabilities. Your perfect discrimination score is going to look like 100%. So here's an example of um, a graph in which on the x-axis you've got subjective probability judgments. On the y-axis you have objective frequencies. And this is an example of someone who never, this is an expert who you might characterize as, as, as rather cowardly. This is an expert who never offers a subjective probability lower than 0.4 or never offers a subjective probability higher than 0.6. So the best you get out of this character is very minor shades of maybe. Uh, nonetheless, this character scores, scores well on calibration because when the, 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 uh, when the individual assigns a probability of 40%, things happen about 40% of the time. When the person assigns a probability of 60%, things happen 60% of the time. So. If your, if your data point is on the diagonal here, you are very well calibrated. You're not very discriminating, though. Uh, this would be an example of good very good calibration and much better discrimination, because now the expert's using a much wider range of the probability scale, from 0.1 all the way to 0.9. And the next one is what we call the God profile. Uh, this, is, this is essentially omniscience. Uh, this is what happened when, when you assign a probability of zero, things never happen. When you assign a probability of one, things always happen. And since you're omniscient and a perfectly deterministic universe, uh, that is, is the way it is. Uh, so this is, this is pretty formidable, and I, I don't think I'll be surprising anybody when I tell you that no human being looks like that. Okay, this is just some technical stuff on probability scoring, which I can come back to if you're interested. Uh, I want to just say a few words about my... <laughs> How, how, I, how I actually came to be doing this. Uh, when you do a, a, a longitudinal study of forecasting accuracy of the sort that I've been doing, it, 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 the, the project starts to feel as long as your entire life. Um, I, I started doing this back in 1984, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm 52, almost 53 years old now, and I just gotten tenure in 1984 at Berkeley, and I, um, I found myself on a committee. It was um, a committee that the National Research Council committed, uh, created uh, to look at the dynamics of American-Soviet relations. Um, and um, I don't know how many of you remember, 1983, early 1984, the bullet of the atomic scientists had pushed its clock closer to midnight than I think any other, but at any other juncture than I think the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, KAL-07 had just been downed, and there was a lot of talk about the growing, growing tension in the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union. And there were a lot of foundations that were interested in funneling money into into research in this area, and this committee existed for that reason. Um, now, the interesting thing about 
the situation was that um, you may uh, Jonathan Shell wrote a book, The Fate of the Earth, uh, in which he uh, characterized uh, Ronald Reagan as a demented bus driver careening down a mountain road with sharp curves. And a lot of people who were liberals thought that Ronald Reagan was indeed bringing us pretty close to the apocalypse. Um, so their basic, their basic and, and, and a lot of people who are conservative thought, well, Reagan's doing the right thing, but the most we can realistically hope in this situation is to contain the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union will retreat into neo-Stalinist mode, and that will be that. Uh, Stuart was actually sharing an interesting story about um, Peter Schwartz and, and, and Robert Gates, and I, I actually had some similar, <laughs> I have a similar kind of story I can share with you later. The dominant view, he was a senior Soviet analyst in the mid-1980s, but the dominant view was that uh, nothing, nothing very good was going to happen. Uh, there were a couple of people, a couple of outliers, who thought that dramatic liberalization under a Gorbachev-like figure could be possible. But it, it was, by and large, certainly, it was certainly not the, uh, the dominant, dominant prediction. So the National Research Council is supposed to be a nonpartisan, value-neutral scientific activity, and they, they very carefully do, do, they do their due diligence, and they, 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 can't, can't, they, they bring Richard Pipes in, and they bring Marshall Shulman in. They, they, but the whole political spectrum was represented in that context. Um, and then along comes Gorbachev. And it was my first encounter with what I call an outcome-irrelevant learning situation. Uh, this is a situation in which no matter how different the ex-ante expectations of the experts were, everyone is in a position after the fact to explain what happens. So uh, it really didn't matter in some sense. The, the liberals could argue, well, no, Reagan didn't, didn't cr create a nuclear war. You know what? Reagan wasted a lot of money and unnecessary defense spending, and the Soviet Union would have evolved in this direction anyway. Uh, although, of course, very few people were predicting that ex ante. And the conservatives, of course, were eager to claim credit now that Ronald Reagan had won the Cold War, even though they had been on record beforehand saying that Gorbachev was really a neo-Stalinist in disguise and it was just a paradishka, a breathing spell bid. Uh, Robert Gates, for example, was identified with that, with that point of view until quite late, actually, uh, in, in the Gorbachev period. Uh, but it was an outcome irrelevant learning situation, and it convinced me that there really would be some great value added if someone tried systematically to keep score on political experts. And that was what I proceeded to do. I'd just gotten tenure, so I didn't have to worry about the uh, gestation period of the project, and um, I moved move, move forward. Uh, now, there, there's a very interesting similarity, I think. Uh, I, I've not only, of course, I've studied the you know, predictions about the Soviet Union quite a while ago, I, I've also monitored some of the more recent predictions about the war in Iraq. And there are some striking similarities in the conceptual structure of the arguments that unfold uh, that are, I, think, I don't think have been adequately commented on. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but it's worth thinking about because it illustrates, I think, it gets to the core, it, it gets to the core answer as to why the concept of good political judgment is so profoundly controversial. Or, as, as my, uh, my, my former colleague Danny Kahneman puts it, what is it about politics that makes people so dumb? Uh, there are, this, is a, this is a standard two-by-two two table here, and the rows are defined by ideological perspectives. The top row represents a view of Reagan or George W. Bush as essentially a good, strong, visionary leader. The bottom row represents a view of Reagan or Bush as essentially a dogmatic, stubborn, somewhat off-track kind of leader. The good historical trajectory represents what happens if things break in uh, the direction that, um, in, the, in the direction of the, po the policy the United States is pursuing at the moment, and the bad historical trajectory is if things break against American policy. So, in the top square, in the in the in the top left, you have direct vindication. So, insofar as the Cold War ended roughly as the on, on American terms, conservatives were quick to claim that forceful policies work. Now, insofar as the Cold War had not ended on on favorable terms for the, for the United States, if in fact you wound up with the kind of situation you wind up, have wound up in Iraq, uh, you would have observed you, you would observe a series of, of belief system defenses. You would observe them saying, and you'll probably recognize some of these arguments in the context of the Iraq debate from neoconservatives, recognized just off on timing. You have to stay the course, you have to be patient. Or the downward counterfactual defense. You think this is bad, you should see what would have happened if we hadn't. 
So you, so the, that's the downward counterfactual. That, that the, the, the war, the, this is a, it's, a, it's a horrible situation we're in, but it would have been even worse. But we made the right mistake. Defend. It, there, there weren't there weren't weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, but it was prudent to set a very low threshold for moving in because that was because making the other mistake, the mistake of not invading when there were weapons of mass destruction, would have been far worse. Uh, now Robert Gates, of course, invoked that argument with respect to Gorbachev in commenting on why he was very slow to recognize that Gorbachev was a genuine liberalizer. He essentially said, "Well, it, it, it was, we were making the right mistake. It was prudent to overestimate, rather, it was more prudent to overestimate the Soviets than to underestimate. Overestimate their capacity, overestimate their maliciousness." And finally, you would take the bad historical trajectory as just further support for the, an essentialist view of the historical adversary. So what you see is, no ma if the Cold War had ended in, a, in an unfort, if, if the Reagan policies had been associated with nasty outcomes, they, they almost certainly would have invoked counterfactual defenses of the sort that you see in the context of Iraq. Um, conversely, uh, you, you have a, a belief system dilemma for, for liberals, and many liberals were in an awkward position explaining why the Cold War ended, despite the fact that they were predicting that Reagan's legacy would be, would, would be a bad one. Uh, so they could invoke the not worth the price defense. They could invoke the other, the upward counterfactual. Uh, things could have been just as good or better, even if we hadn't spent all this money. And they can invoke their version of the we made the right mistake defense. Um, so what, what you have is an interesting kind of intellectual stalemate in which, uh, because there are no control groups in history, uh, because nobody knows how history would have unfolded if it hadn't been President Reagan, if it had been a two-term Carter presidency with a two-term Mondale follow-up, who in the audience really knows whether the Cold War would have ended in roughly the same way? It's, some, it's simply not something available for human empirical knowledge. Uh, and for that matter, nobody can really say for sure what would have happened in the world in which we hadn't gone into Iraq. Uh, it's just that the world that we're in seems so bad that it's hard to imagine an alternative world uh, that would be worse. But it's not impossible. Certainly not impossible. All right. So it was this experience uh, with, uh, with outcome-irrelevant learning situations in the 1980s that led me to the view that... Uh, Partisans across the opinion spectrum are vulnerable to occasional bouts of ideologically induced insanity. And it is crucial. There's a great public need for developing what I call epistemic or knowledge standards for judging judgment. And having standards for judging judgment that somehow transcend, transcend ideological boundaries. Well, my effort to develop these standards was described in great didactic detail in the book. Uh, but the key idea is to work out ground rules for keeping score that advocates of competing points of view can agree in advance, are fair, and therefore they find it awkward to denounce those standards after the fact when they're in an awkward position. So we did this project over a long period of time, an 18-year project. Uh, we had 284 experts in international affairs. And they were assigning predictions, um, roughly, about, roughly about 100 each expert on average, coming out to about 28,000. Um, virtually all of them had some postgraduate training, roughly 12 years of work experience. And they included a mixture of academics, journalists, some intelligence analysts, and um, people in various think tanks. There are certain key requirements for developing good questions. Uh, you need to specify the outcome so clearly that they pass the clairvoyance test. So if Stuart were a true clairvoyant, I could hand my predictions to him, and Stuart could tell you whether the predictions were right or wrong without the need to come back to me and say, oh, oh, uh, uh, Tetlock, what exactly did you mean by a Polish Peron? Or what did you mean by a backlash in South Africa? Or what did the, kinds of the, the, the types of vague verbiage you often get from experts. Um, once you've uh, identified the possible futures and in su sufficiently clearly to pass the clairvoyance test, then you get the ac experts to place subjective probabilities on each set. And a lot of our questions have this kind of a format. So central government debt in country X is going to either hold between 35 and 40 percent of GDP. It's going to fall below or rise above that range. Right? I mean, 
Now, this was one of the more far-sighted questions we asked, although this question, you might note, was not all that far-sighted because it never really occurred to us that the Communist Party would collapse. <laughs> The closest we came to anticipating the future here was its, 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 its control would weaken. Um, but it's, it's an illustration of what we're, what we're getting at. So we asked a lot of questions, 59 different nation states, plus some questions bearing on the EU, NATO, World Trade Organization, lots of different things, economic performance, growth, inflation, un unemployment, policy priorities, defense spending, leadership changes, uh, border conflicts, entry, exit from international agreements, and we had different types of forecasting horizons for different variables. So we had shorter ranges for the faster moving variables like stock markets. And we had slower, we had very long time horizons for things that move very slowly, like border changes, for example. Uh, so some of our predictions haven't even come due yet, having to do with border changes. Okay, among other things, we discover this. We discover that contrary to what most political partisans would have expected, namely that their side would win, um, we find that traditional divisions of political opinion don't matter all that much. It didn't matter all that much. It, it, in, in terms of academia, we had lots of different theoretical contrasts that might sound a little alien. We had realists versus institutionalists or uh, constructivists. And we, we had, um, but we had optimists versus pessimists, boomsters versus doomsters. Didn't make much of a difference. Uh, we had um, liberals versus conservatives. It didn't make all that much of a difference. The content of what people thought was not a very good predictor of how accurate they were. What was a good predictor of how accurate they were was how they thought. At least if you're, if you're, what you're interested in is aggregate accuracy. What matters is principally how you think. And this brings us to the point about foxes and hedgehogs. And I was actually stunned by the consistency of the result that experts whom we classified as foxes, and I can explain how we classified ex experts into these categories in a moment, but experts who, whom we classified as foxes beat hedgehogs, and it was an advantage we could not make a goal. It was very hard to make it disappear statistically. So we tweaked it in all sorts of different ways to see if it was an artifact of chance in some way or an artifact of different error avoidance priorities, all, all sorts of different uh, control mechanisms. And the fox advantage really does, it does prove to be quite robust. But who are these foxes and hedgehogs? Well, there's an essay by Isaiah Berlin that came out about 45 years ago in which he draws on a fragment of Greek poetry from 2,500 years ago by the Greek warrior poet Archilochus, uh, which is roughly translated as, the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. Um, and he, he defines the ideal type hedgehog as uh, an expert or a professional or a thinker who relates everything to a single central vision in terms of which all that they say has significance. So you could be a Marxist hedgehog or you could be a libertarian hedgehog. You could be a boomster hedgehog or you could be a doomster Malthusian hedgehog. Uh, you could be a realist hedgehog. You could be an idealist hedgehog. Um, the important thing is that you approach history you approach current events in a deductive frame of mind. You have certain first principles and you try as hard as you can to absorb as many different facts into the framework of those first principles. Now that might sound like rigidity, but if you think about it for a minute, from a philosophy of science point of view, it also is parsimony. That is what scientists are supposed to do. They're supposed to explain as much as possible with as little as possible. So we'll come back to that, that value tension in a moment. Um, the ideal type foxes, Berlin defined this way, he said they pursue many ends, often unrelated and even contradictory. And they entertain ideas that are centrifugal rather than centripetal without seeking to fit them into or exclude them from any one all embracing inner vision. Those are the foxes. So foxes and hedgehogs. Uh, foxes are skeptical of big theories. Uh, you're, you're not going to find very many foxes who are true believers. Uh, and interestingly, the foxes who did the best of my forecasting exercises were the least enthusiastic about participating, and they were the most diffident about their ability to forecast, uh, because they really do th see history as in, 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 in substantial measure as quite, as quite unpredictable. Uh, whereas the hedgehogs were more enthusiastic about it. They, they tend to be more enthusiastic about extending their favorite theories into new domains, and they tend to be more confident in their ability to predict. Now, this is some, some, some data, which I'll just go over very quickly. 
if, if you're on the, per the perfect diagonal, the straight line here represents perfect calibration. So the, whereas the, uh, the curvy lines represent actual groups of human beings making thousands of predictions. And these are aggregations of that. And the key thing to note here is that one of the lines strays further from the perfect diagonal than all the other lines. So the line that strays furthest is the line in which hedgehogs are making long-term predictions within the domains of their expertise. Uh, whereas the line that's closest to the perfect diagonal is foxes making short-term predictions within the domain of their expertise. Um, now there's an argument that, that started to unfold about whether the, fox, whether the foxes were doing better than the hedgehogs, not because they're more perceptually accurate, but rather because the foxes are, excuse the pun, foxes were chickens. The foxes were un unwilling to say anything much more than maybe. So the foxes were clinging around the subjective probability point of 0.5. Right. So one way to test that, if that were true, then the foxes should not be as discriminating as the hedgehogs. The hedgehogs should, may, may lose on calibration, but they should win on discrimination. So in this uh, little, little graph here, what we do is we plot both calibration, better calibration on the x-axis, better discrimination on the y-axis, and as you move toward the upper right, you move toward better and better performance. And what you see is that the fox, FST, FLT represent foxes making short-term and long-term predictions. And you can see that they're doing better than hedgehogs making short-term and long-term predictions, HST and HLT, and uh, they're better on both calibration and discrimination. So I think that rules out the foxes were just chickens hypothesis. There is, however, one slightly disturbing result, at least from the standpoint of um, those who want to argue that the foxes are, are particularly brilliant. And that is when you compare the fox, accuracy of fox predictions to the accuracy of predictions that you could have generated by using very simple statistical algorithms, like predict no change, or predict the most recent rate of change. When you use that as your benchmark of comparison, uh, that's, well, that's what we're calling MC, mindless competition. Uh, and you can see the mindless competition is pretty close <laughs> to the foxes. And, and uh, so it, it's, it's not exactly a, a, a great vindication of, 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 of human intuitive judgment. Um, now, you might ask, what do hedgehogs do well? And the answer is they assign higher probabilities to big changes that do materialize. So if you want to know who is really out front, really out front in predicting some of the bigger changes that have occurred over the last 20 years, and it, it, there were a couple of hedgehogs actually out front with respect to the Soviet Union and the decline of the Soviet Union. We called them ethnic nationalist fundamentalists. These were people who argued that the Soviet Union was essentially a prison house of nations. It was inherently unstable, and it was going to fall apart. Now, bear in mind, these people had been predicting the Soviet Union would fall apart back in the 1960s and the 1970s as well. You know, it's like the broken clock is, is, is eventually right. Um, but, they, but, but they were right about this. Uh, they, they're, they're right, but they're right because at, at a high price. It, it, you're paying a high price in false positive predictions. So when you rely on the hedgehogs, the hedgehog predictors, uh, you're going to get a lot of false positives. So the price of, being, of successfully predicting the disintegration of Yugoslavia or the disintegration of the Soviet Union is that you're also predicting the disintegration of Canada, of India, of Kazakhstan, uh, of Indonesia, of Nigeria, of South Africa. It's a long list. Um, and that, that, of course, helps to explain why the hedgehogs aren't doing as well. They're assigning high probabilities to low-frequency events, which makes them much more interesting than the foxes. <laughs> uh, but it also makes them uh, substantially more incorrect. Now, a friend of mine, Nassim Taleb, who, who, I, whom I suspect will probably be here at some point, uh, has just finished writing a book on black swans, um, in which he talks about the radical unpredictability of the world. Um, if you want to know um, the, the advantage of being a hedgehog, it's that there is always, there's usually at least a few of them who are out front in predicting outlandish outcomes. So, actual black swans that the hedgehogs were in the forefront of, predict, of, of expecting. At least a few hedgehogs. There are, mo most hedgehogs were wrong, but there were at least a few hedgehogs who were out front. Were, uh, and the list here is collapse of the USSR in 1991, the Yugoslav Civil War, um, Saddam's invasion of Kuwait, the Rwandan genocide, 
uh, financial turbulence preceding the collapse of long-term capital management in 1998, uh, the East Asian currency crisis and the Russian debt default, um, the internet bubble, the 90s, it is puncturing uh, terrorist strikes, um, although no one's predicting 9-11, but terrorist, in, in, increased incidents of terrorism. Um, but again, lots of false positives. Uh, so predictions of the Great American and then Global Depression of 1990s. Remember Dow 36,000? Remember NASDAQ 5,000? We actually had NASDAQ 5,000. Uh, or Dow 1,500 and NASDAQ 350. Um, predicting a neo-Stalinist coup in Moscow that brings the return of the Cold War. And of course, predicting full-blown civil wars in places such as South Africa, Nigeria, Pakistan, India, China, Korean Peninsula, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. And even the use of nuclear weapons uh, in the Indian subcontinent or the Korean Peninsula, the two most uh, popular sites for making predictions of that sort. Now, I, I'm gonna, I think I've run out of time, so I, I should be, get, uh, how much more time do I have? I, okay, uh, well, I, I, want, I want to leave lots of time for questioning, uh, but I, I want to say that I, I think that it's, it's, it's tempting for me as a psychologist who is long interested in individual differences to treat this as a horse race between foxes and hedgehogs. But I think that's fundamentally the wrong way of looking at this. I think it makes more sense to think about hedgehogs and foxes existing in kind of interdependent intellectual ecosystems. So on the one hand, you've got the hedgehogs who are very good at seizing on big ideas and pushing them as far as reasonable, and then often a good deal further. Um, and on the other hand, you have the foxes almost playing the role of intellectual scavengers. Uh, they're picking bits and pieces of big hedgehog ideas, and they're creating eclectic mishmashes that on average have more predictive power than the original ideas had. So I think this has interesting implications for optimal intellectual diversity in setting up teams. Um, I think I'd also say, I'll give you a quick example of how that would work in, in, in the context of the Soviet Union. Um, the, um, there were some people, um, Jerry Huff I'm thinking of, a Sovietologist for example, who were out front in predicting that Gorbachev would be a liberalizer. Uh, before a lot of other people were. Um, but the people who are out front in predicting that Gorbachev would be a liberalizer tended to be people who saw the Soviet system as having more internal legitimacy than it did. The people who thought that Gorbachev being a liberal, it would be impossible to have a liberalizer emerge out of the Kremlin, the Gene Kirkpatrick's and Richard Pipes of the world, who saw the Soviet system as infallibly self-reproducing in a totalitarian mode, uh, those people thought that a, a Gorbachev liberalization would be impossible because the Kremlin leadership would recognize that if they liberalized, things would fall apart. <laughs> so they wouldn't be stupid enough to do that. Um, so uh, who would be best positioned both to predict Gorbachev liberalization and Soviet disintegration? It wasn't the liberals who thought the Soviet system had more legitimacy than that. And it wasn't the conservatives who were ruling out the possibility of liberalization in the first place. It was a small group of foxes who had successfully managed to, to integrate in their minds some liberal cognitions and some, some, some conservative cognitions. They, had they were willing to accept the liberal insight that the Soviet leadership, like most political leaderships in, in human history, was not totally monolithic, and there were genuine differences of opinion within it. So they're willing to accept that. But they also tended toward the more conservative view that the Soviet system didn't have legitimacy, and that once the lid was lifted, all hell would break loose. Um, so that's an interesting way of looking at uh, perhaps the situation in Iraq. Uh, you could imagine um, various types of fox cognitions there. Uh, you could imagine fox cognitions that would, would try, try this dissonant possibility, for example. It could well be that the Bush administration made a massive, massive mistake. It's, it certainly is the case that uh, the conservative we've, we've studied who were sympathetic to the invasion of Iraq in the first place were, have been wrong on many, many predictions um, over the last two to three years. Um, but it's also the case that nobody knows what's going to happen in the next 20 or 30 years. Uh, so um, foxes often have a way of, taking, of staking out interesting contrarian positions that both liberals and conservatives find irksome. Um, 
And a, a, a Fox position might be that the, it, 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 would, it, might, it might annoy conservatives by saying that the Iraq war was stupid. On the other hand, it might annoy liberals by saying you know, that it's, it's, it, 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 it's perfectly possible in the next 10 or 15 years the situation in Iraq might be far better than it would have been if uh, Iraq had been under the leadership of uh, uh, Uday Hussein. Uh, so foxes have a way of, um, of annoying people across the political spectrum. Uh, they have a way of annoying people who have entrenched theoretical positions. And uh, those are the people who, in my exercises, tend to do, tend to do better. Uh, they don't get everything right. They get a lot of things wrong. Uh, I, I think we live in an inherently probabilistic world, and nobody, nobody's really expecting omniscience. Um, but it, it turns out that a somewhat contrarian, self-critical cognitive style does translate into... Uh, more realistic subjective probabilities being assigned to possible futures. And if you think that there's, uh, that good policy depends on assigning more realistic probabilities to possible futures, or if, you're into, if you think that making more money <laughs> depends on assigning realistic subjective probabilities to possible futures, that's probably a result worth, um, worth taking into consideration. Um, do you have enough questions? Or... Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, this is hot stuff. Thank you. I can't help wondering right from the start, uh, you were looking at predictors. Some of these predictors uh, hold policy positions. You mentioned Robert M. Gates at CIA. Does it make a difference if people who are actually taking responsibility for these decisions are foxes or hedgehogs? Um, you know, I, I do have to make a disclaimer. Uh, in order to get the cooperation of the people that I got the cooperation of, I had to promise them anonymity. So I can't say, I cannot confirm one way or the other whether any particular person was a participant in this forecasting exercise. I, could, it's, I, I think it's public knowledge that Robert Gates in the mid-1980s was a senior Soviet, Soviet analyst who was very reluctant to acknowledge that Gorbachev was a genuine liberalizer. Fair enough. Uh, yeah. In fact, the, the, the story on that's actually worth telling because it relates to this whole question of the, the one big idea or the, the foxy approach to many ideas. Uh, the conversation that was had in the 1980s was when my colleague and a board member here, Peter Schwartz, uh, was at Royal Dutch Shell, and they did some scenarios of what was going to happen in the Soviet Union. And basically, just looking at the core economics there, they concluded that one of four potential scenarios was that Soviet Union would collapse, and a sign, a leading indicator, as we say, of that direction would be if this uh, mid-level guy named Gorbachev started rising to the top. And indeed, that was what came to pass, and this was one of the few uh, groups that actually predicted that. While that was still just a prediction, Peter was asked to give a presentation of the senior leadership of the CIA to uh, spell all of this out. And so he went through the four uh, scenarios that were being considered in a very foxy way. And one person across the table said, uh, I'm fine with this. It's a good way to think. On the other hand, one of your scenarios that one about the collapse of the Soviet Union is should not be on the table at all. It will not happen in my lifetime or your lifetime or your children's lifetime. Those people are there to stay. And that was Robert M. Gates, our new Secretary of Defense. <laughs> so I'm not giving away any, any of your secrets when I mention that. But what's interesting, and, and this is what I'm coming to here, is here's a person who's gone from policy analyst to now a position of real power. Mm -hmm. um, and what's your sense of how this different frames of looking at things, learning from mistakes and stuff like that, plays out in policy makers as well as policy advisors? I think one of the most interesting differences between hedgehogs and foxes uh, in, our, in our data set is that hedgehogs are substantially more willing to use the extreme endpoints of the probability scale. When you say there's a probability of 1.0 of something happening, you're saying that you cannot imagine any alternative to that possible future. When you attach a probability of zero to something happening, you're saying take it off the table. It's not, it's not, it's not even worth your consideration. Um, hedgehogs are roughly two and a half to three times as likely to assign zeros or ones to possible futures. Uh, and that is, they, they, they do indeed 
their, their accuracy does indeed suffer because when they say things are inevitable, the, those things uh, happen only about 78% of the time. And when they say things are impossible, th th those things happen about 20% of the time. Uh, so you, you, you're, 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 you're taking, a, taking a big hit. Um, it's also the case psychologically that the, I mean, mathematically the subjective probability scale is, is a linear interval scale. So when you move from a probability of, of uh, uh, 0 to 0.1, that is from a mathematical point of view should be the same as moving from probability from 0.1 to 0.2 or from 0.2 to 0.3. When economists do their expected utility calculations and so forth, probabilities are treated as, 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 as interacting in a, in a multiplicative way with utilities. So the, the, the probability scale has a clear mathematical meaning in that sense. For human beings, that's not the way things work. Um, in fact, one of the most, uh, one of the best psychologists who ever studied probability, his name is Amos Tversky, he passed away about 10 years ago now. Uh, he was fond of saying that human beings can really only distinguish three levels of probability. You know, not, not, not 10 or 100. Uh, people can only distinguish three levels of probability. Things, things are impossible, things are certain, and then there's maybe. <laughs> Uh, and, and everything else, every, everything between impossibility and inevitability is, is he thought of as being rel relatively mushy. Um, so when you assign a probability of zero or one, people really listen. Uh, when I, if I were to say, well, you know, I've, I've changed my probability from 0.6 to 0.7, that doesn't have anywhere near the impact of saying, I, I've, I've moved from 0.9 to 1.0, or I've moved from 0.1. If Gates had said, well, it's only a 10% probability, he's, but he said, no, it's zero. Take it off, take it off the table. Uh, that, 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 is, that is interesting. Now, it is true that Gates later would argue that the reason he was so skeptical of the genuineness of Soviet reform is that um, uh, he thought that um, it was the prudent mistake to be making. It was the right mistake. That he, 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 he sort of knew that Gorbachev really was, uh, he seemed to be some kind of genuine liberal. He was willing to concede that, uh, but, but he, he, had a, he just set his threshold for saying that very high. And, it, uh, and he, of course, never reached that threshold until after the fact. Um, Do we waste our time telling hedgehogs that they're wrong? I mean, you know, <laughs> these talking heads on the television keep blathering away, and you can show them, it seems like you can show them video of them saying something which turned out to be grotesquely wrong, and they don't care. Uh, uh, what's going on there? Um, what, what, what you see when you, you, you come back to experts and you say to them, well, you know, you, you attached um, you know, a, a point eight likelihood to this event, and, 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 it, and it didn't happen. This, this other thing that you only attached a 0.1 likelihood or a 0.2 likelihood to, that happened instead. What can they say? Well, in any given instance, it's very hard to say that they're wrong. I mean, you, if, if, if the surgeon says there's a 0.9 likelihood of you recovering and, and, and you fail to recover, the surgeon can quite legitimately say, well, there's a 0.1 likelihood of you're not recovering and we happen to have slipped into an unlikely world. That's why it's so critical when you measure good judgment to measure good judgment repeatedly. Uh, you need to make the law of large numbers work for you because you, there, you, experts have the perfectly legitimate, philosophically legitimate defense, well, we happen to live in an unlikely world. Uh, that defense wears thin <laughs> the more often it's invoked. Now, e experts have a lot of other very ingenious ways of neutralizing inconvenient facts. So if you had expected, for example, that Canada would disintegrate, a number of very thoughtful people thought that Canada was finished, uh, and and they, may, they may be right. Maybe they are just off on timing. And, but that is the defense they'll offer. They'll say, well, Canada hasn't disintegrated yet. It hasn't disintegrated by 2002. But you know what? It will by 2012. I was, I was merely off on timing, and only a pedantic hair-splitting split, professor would possibly care about, or care about that. Or they might say something like, you know what? I'm wrong, but I was almost right. So people who thought that the, 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 the disintegration of the Soviet Union was uh, a very unlikely possibility argued that, well, you know what? If that coup attempt in August 1991 had succeeded, if Khrushchev and those other guys who were attempting that coup against Gorbachev in August 91, if they'd been a little more sober and a little better organized and they'd done a couple of other things right, uh, they could have succeeded and there might be a Soviet Union with us today. Now, whether you believe that those kind of butterfly flapping wing scenarios are right, uh, it, it's, it's interesting that experts tend to invoke them more frequently when they're useful for, rec for rescuing floundering forecasts. 
Uh, here's a question from, I think it's Charles Warner, or a name that looks like that. Uh, why didn't you include a non-expert control group in your 18-year study to see if the experts were any better or worse? Oh, we did. We did. Uh, I, in fact, maybe I can go back to that. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, we, we actually have a number of minimalist baselines uh, for comparing. Whoops, where did I go? Let me, excuse me for one second here. I'm, I'm, way, I'm way off of... Hmm. It, we, what we did is we, um, we asked a group of briefly briefed Berkeley undergraduates in the early 1990s to make a series of predictions about some of the countries that experts were making predictions of in the 1992 round of forecasting exercises. And what happened is a little bit gratifying for the experts. Uh, there, is, there aren't many sources of gratification here for experts, but they did indeed Beat the, this is a particular kind of dilettante that they, they resoundingly beat. They, they, they beat their own students, at least. Um, uh, the, da the data point here, number 37, represents the briefly brief, briefed Berkeley undergraduates. So what that means is the Berkeley, briefly briefed Berkeley undergraduates were worse on calibration and worse on discrimination than even the very worst hedgehogs. So uh, there, there actually was some superiority uh, manifested there. It's a, it's a very complicated question of what, what, what are the right control groups here. I mean, we also included the minimal, the, the mindless competition, the simple statistical algorithms, seeing how, whether experts could outpredict simple extrapolation algorithms and, th and things of that sort. And that was very hard competition for experts to beat. And when you ramp it up a little bit and use more sophisticated statistical models, the ex virtually all the experts lose. Um, which, is a, which is an interesting fact for those of you who are interested in the debate between actuarial versus intuitive forecasting approaches. Intuitive does well? Well, well no. <laughs> right, thanks. <laughs> Be foxy. A um, couple of questions relate here on, on sort of best activity. Gary Wolf, where's Gary? Right back here. Uh, are there prodigies of prediction, outliers whose performance is so good that they suggest tools of approach worth studying? And another person asks, um, from Ben, uh, who is the single most accurate expert you studied and how accurate was that person? <laughs> well, I can't. The second question, unfortunately, you I... You can be I, pretty I, generic I, in describing <laughs> that, right? Um, <laughs> was anybody really accurate as well, the first you know, part of the, that? The thing, the thing is, if you reveal the winners, you're implying the losers in some, in some contexts. Um, Good. <laughs> what was the other question? <laughs> oh, about well, are, were there are there are there outliers? Are, are are there people whose forecasting performance is just really off the charts? Um, and the short answer to that is no. Uh, my data are much more consistent with the Andy Warhol fifteen minutes of fame hypothesis that everybody, even even the hedgehogs, have their moments in the sun. Every, everybody gets some things right. Um, the foxes tend, on average, to be right more often, but it's not that they're spectacularly right. I mean, you see, the, 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 the very best foxes are only slightly better than simple extrapolation algorithms. So the notion that there are forecasting geniuses in my data set, I, I, I really can't say there's much support for that. It, it, it's, it's, I, I hate to deromanticize this, but... Uh, it's, it's, it's a story of a lot of uh, human beings, thoughtful, very well educated, extremely thoughtful, extremely knowledgeable human beings make, making good faith efforts to understand the world around them. And the world is really hard. It's, it's just char it's, it's a highly probabilistic, quirky place. Uh, it's really hard to, uh, there, there aren't any control groups for drawing causal lessons. Everything is hinging on counterfactual comparisons. It's very, very hard uh, for, given the information at our disposal, and given the highly politicized nature of these debates, for human beings to, to do all that well. Now, there are mechanisms for trying to improve things, uh, which I think are interesting. And, and we, we've done a little bit of work with them, but not much. Uh, and uh, prediction markets, I think, are a, a, a tool that, that is, is worth, I think, pursuing seriously. Prediction markets do force people to be more fox-like. Prediction markets force people to second-guess their own judgment because when you're, doing, when you're participating in a prediction market, you're aware that other people are second-guessing you. 
So it naturally puts you in a more self-critical mindset. And I think that there is evidence that that does improve, um, improve, improve the quality of judgment. It's not, it's not turning people into visionaries. I mean, we're not, we're not dealing with a biblical prophecy here. <laughs> we're, we're, we're dealing, but we're dealing with incremental statistical improvements. Have you tried uh, racing prediction markets against experts? Um, well, the, the data are pretty clear. I mean, have you had Sir Wiki come here, at Wisdom of the Crowd? We haven't yet, and there's a question asking how does this relate to his stuff. With Wisdom of the Crowd, uh, it, it does relate uh, in, in, in complicated ways. Uh, it, it generally is the case that, that aggregates of experts do better than the individual experts. Hmm. Um, and what happens here, it's a little bit complicated. Um, the hedgehogs make more extreme mistakes in both directions. They're over-predicting change for the worse, they're over-predicting change for the better. So when you take a statistical average of hedgehogs, those, if, if those errors tend to cancel each other out. So the average hedgehog prediction is much, much better than the ind average individual hedgehog. There's a huge improvement from aggregation there. Um, the foxes also benefit somewhat, but they don't benefit nearly as much from aggregation as the hedgehogs do. So if you're going to have a lot of hedgehogs on your team, you really want to consider <laughs> some kind of aggregation rule. And this is without any prediction market stuff. This is simple statistical averaging now. Uh, the, the foxes get, get some increment, but the hedgehogs get a really big increment. And I, I, I would think that those effects would probably be more pronounced in the prediction market context, but um, I don't have anything definitive to say on that. Here's a question from Robin Sloan. There's Robin, way back there. Um, I love this kind of tracking. Any plans or just ideas to bring prediction accountability more strongly into the public sphere? Maybe you could start a website. Uh, what do you think? Would that have value? And for example, I could imagine on this uh, racing not only expert opinion, perhaps named expert opinion, because this would all be out in public, and yeah, it would be public opinions which they've expressed. Uh, you could run your prediction algorithms. I'd love to know what they are, for example. It sounds like one of them is things won't change very much. They're pretty simple. <laughs> okay, what are the others, just to, to know? Well, predict the most recent rate of change. Okay. Yeah, and then there's a simple, there's a couple of simple time series autoregressive mm -hmm. kinds of models. That, yeah. Since those are so good, better than most hedgehogs and, and as good as many foxes, it'd be kind of fun to see those out in public where people could just, you know, look at that in context of things that we care about. And then uh, you know, race it against uh, the wisdom of crowds and the rest of it. And right. see these things play out where I think the suggestion here at Long Bets is sort of about this, is that people get to watch this in progress and in a sense participate in it with their own voting or whatever it might be. Right. I, I think that's an excellent idea. Um, I, I have a certain amount, I, I think it's a great idea, but I'm also a little bit pessimistic and I'll explain why. Um, I, I think that you have to ask yourself, what are people consuming when they're consuming expert judgment? Are they consuming truth claims, the way I say an analytical philosopher would say, they're, they're interested fundamentally in the truth of subjective probability claims, or are they consuming interesting stories? Uh, consider, for example, uh, Saudi Arabia. People have been predicting the disintegration of the Saudi royal family and, and the Saudi regime for 20 plus years now. Uh, eventually, they may well be right. Uh, the Saudi regime may well fall. But imagine you've got two different. Imagine you're, you know, producing a television show, say, or you 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 want to attract a large audience, and you have a choice between two experts. One of them is a fox who has a much higher calibration discrimination score, and who comes on and says, well, you know what? Yes, there's about a point two four chance that the uh, the Saudi the Saudi regime will disintegrate. Uh, it's it's a fairly low probability though, because uh, in general, it's a bad bet to bet against regimes that control powerful means of coercion and regimes that control large amounts of money and that can co-opt opposition. Uh, the Saudi regime has a lot of resources at its disposal to stabilize the situation, but there are inherent sources of instability. Versus someone who comes on and says, you know, the Saudi regime is doomed, and that uh, says it confidently, says it emphatically, with a very high probability, verging on certainty, and then sketches an interesting story about some young, ambitious, uh, fundamentalist Islamic colonels in the Saudi Royal Air Force or whatever it is, uh, taking over. Um, and the and, uh, price of oil going up to $150 a barrel and all, all, all sorts of terrible things. So if, if it's, it's, not, it's not really an even contest, is it? Uh, even though the apocalyptic expert is almost certainly going to do worse <laughs> in my study than the, than, than, than the more restrained expert. The apocalyptic expert is just 
vastly more mediagenic, uh, just vastly more attractive uh, to a mass audience. I and <laughs> They're changing it to hedgehog news, actually. <laughs> well, <laughs> that'll be fun. You, you mentioned before uh, we came up here that uh, one indicator was sort of the, the, the degree of charisma of the uh, public expert. How mm -hmm. does that play against this? Well, what we find, essentially, is that there is an inverse relationship between what makes people attractive as public presenters and what makes them accurate in these forecasting ex exercises. <laughs> what we're saying, the, the, here, here's a very quick, crude indicator. Uh, the more howevers, buts, all those you hear in an expert statement, the more signs that an expert is qualifying and layering and indicating trade-offs and, 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 and sources of uncertainty, uh, the more people's eyes are likely to glaze over, <laughs> but the more likely the expert, the, the expert subjective probabilities are going to translate into something reasonably accurate. Uh, so there is a dilemma here, uh, and it, it's, a, it's an it's a, it's there. Uh, a couple of questions here that relate. One from Andrew Fitzgerald: Did you find your subjects uh, to learn from their mistakes once they start keeping score? Do they try to improve it? And uh, another question. Um, can how to think be measured and taught? Um, those, are, those are really hard and interesting questions. Um, experts do change their mind to some degree. In the fourth chapter of my book, I, I, I go into what happens when experts win and lose reputational bets. Reputational bet is when you assign different likelihoods to outcomes based on my opponent's understanding and my understanding, and we see what happens, and then one side owes, more, owes belief change to another side. And uh, there is some change. Now, most of the, as you might expect, experts are much more likely to change their minds and increase their confidence in their position when they get it right. <laughs> so experts increasing the, the, the likelihood of their being right, that, that's a relatively easy thing. The unnatural thing is reducing their confidence in their prior position. Foxes do that more than hedgehogs. That is, I believe, part of the mechanism by which they're able to achieve superior accuracy. They do change their minds in a more timely way. Um, but it doesn't feel like dogmatism to those who are resisting changing their minds. Uh, it feels like they're, they're, that, that things happen that were not reasonably foreseeable, and they're simply qualifying a previous position in a reasonable way. Um, that Canada did almost come undone. For example, consider that Canada, um, the, the, whether Canada was going to come apart, was, it was an issue in, in contention in the 1990s. The second secessionist referendum in Quebec, it, was like almost, it wasn't quite as close as the Florida vote in 2000, but it was 50.1% uh, voting no, voting against uh, secession. Uh, that's well within the margin of sampling error. So is an expert wrong for saying, well, it almost happened? Uh, there is a certain amount of indeterminacy in the world, and it, it, it just happens to be the case that experts latch on to that indeterminacy kind of strategically, and they, they, they're much more likely to embrace indeterminacy when it helps them to save their preconceptions, and the hedgehogs are especially likely to do that. So from your background in psychology, um, do people ever change their thinking mode? Do hedgehogs ever become foxes? Do foxes ever fall in love with one of their theories and become hedgehogs? Yeah, um, or is this genetic? Well, uh, um, you know, I, can, that's a great question. Can I come? There, there was a second question actually about whether people can be trained. <laughs> okay. And I, I think that's the, I wanted to come to that, and, but I'll, I'll, I'll return to that other one too. Uh, that is one of the hardest, uh, not fully resolved questions in the psychological literature: is whether training people in calibration exercises, for example, is going to generalize. So if I can, if, if we work through a series of exercises uh, in which, um, you know, you were to make judgments about whether France is bigger than Spain or whether the moon ever comes closer than 225,000 miles to the earth, if you made a bunch of judgments in, in different domains, would that generalize into a superior calibration and superior forecasting skill going forward in other domains? Would it make you a better predictor of... Uh, um, uh, trends in financial markets or political trends or what have you. Uh, that, that issue has not really been, been resolved. There, there, there's certainly work in progress on that. Um, there seems to be some generalizability, but it's, very, it's hard. It's hard to get, to get big generalizability effects. 
Uh, I, there, there, there's, there's a certain amount of charlatanism running around. There are certainly people who are making claims that they can train you and they can transform you. Uh, and I would, I, would, I would caution about that. But, but it, it, there, there, there may be some element of truth to the, to the, to the training. So back to the question, is it genetic? Um, well, it's not even a dichotomy. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, I mean, I mean, Isaiah Berlin actually talked about hedgehogs who wished they were foxes and foxes who thought they were hedgehogs. And he talked about Tolstoy, he looked like he was both. Right, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and we, we actually do break down this. We, we, we have a, a series of questions for classifying people as, as, as hedgehogs or foxes. And uh, it, it's, it's like a personality scale. And uh, you, 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 can, you can slice and dice it in lots of ways. And, and, and doing simply a, an absolute dichotomy, median split kind of thing, hedgehogs and foxes, is quite artificial. I mean, there, there are some people, the people in the middle are, are really hybrids of various sorts. And, and the hybrids do behave somewhat differently from the people at the extremes. Is there an age um, uh, element, by the way? Does someone ever start out sort of foxy and wind up hedgehoggy? Uh, people do change. Uh, and, and, but there, I was going to come to your point about genetics be, be, because the fox hedgehog scale is very closely related to uh, the openness factor in the major taxonomy of personality called the Big Five. And there are lots of behavioral genetic studies that bear on that, uh, including identical twin studies mm -hmm. and the like. Uh, so, and the, so the answer is there is some genetic component to being right. a fox or a hedgehog. The answer is also that there's a large socialization component to it, and most people who are reasonably intelligent have within their repertoire doing it either way. Um, so it, it's, 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 not, it's not totally fixed, uh, but it is a preferred style that some people more, much more readily slip into than other people do, and, um, and they don't see it as a bias. Well, you get people sort of breaking down, they're foxy about their business, but they're a hedgehog when it comes to religion or something like that? Sure, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, just in your pool of the experts that you were looking at, a uh, question from Karen Tomlinson out there. Uh, what is the percent of the pool who are hedgehogs versus foxes? Um, you can define that. That's, that's a tricky one. If, if, if you just use a median split, you can just arbitrarily say 50-50. Uh, my, my sense is that a, a more realistic interpretation of the scale would be that you have about you ha you have a, a reasonably normal distribution with fat tails, um, in which you've, you've got about twenty percent fit fairly nicely within the fox, twenty percent within the hedgehog, and then about sixty percent of the population I don't think are, are are all that readily classifiable one way or the other. You could think of them as switch hitters or cognitively ambidextrous, whatever you want to want to, want to say there. there. <laughs> um, a uh, question here, uh, anonymous, interestingly. Uh, are you a fox or a hedgehog? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, he's thinking I'm a fox. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it's in the, when, when you're so immersed in this stuff, it, it, it's, 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 it's hard. Um, and I, 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 ran, I I ran into a lot of experts who really balked at this classification scheme, and I have to admit, I, 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 I you're one of them. I, 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 I sympathized with them. <laughs> I sympathized with them, um, but uh, it, it, it's, it's going to sound as though I'm, I'm uh, favoring my own side. But I, I do think of myself. I, I like to think of myself temperamentally as more fox-like, but I, I, can, I often sense myself slipping into hedgehog dogmatism. Um, so I. What's your sense of the sort of future of this lore? I mean, here's a bunch of people, and then there'll be tens of thousands who will sample this online, who are now hip to uh, this whole point that you've been making, you've been studying for two decades. You know, as that becomes public knowledge, that there are these two ways of thinking about uh, the future, and one is actually more in aggregate accurate than the other, is there any possibility the behavior would... Uh, move in some aggregate way as a result of that? It, it's certainly possible, but the reactions that hedgehogs have to empirical surprises, the reactions hedgehogs have mm -hmm. when relatively unexpected things occur, suggest a great reluctance to acknowledge that, one, that, they're, that they are wrong in any significant respect. Uh, so I, I'm not sure I see... It, 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 it takes very dramatic evidence to induce belief change. So I think, I think change does occur. 
from, uh, uh, isolationism in America disappeared after Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. uh, there were lots of isolationists, and then suddenly it was a, a political perspective that was legitimate and influential suddenly it, disappeared. It may come back after <laughs> Iraq. <laughs> um, so dramatic events can do that, but... Um, Okay, hedgehogs won't change. That's their specialty. How about foxes? Would foxes get more kind of uh, loud and proud and confident and have more audience uh, with their howevers because of all this? Well, the way the system works, uh, foxes typically make such qualified and nuanced predictions. They're not in a very strong rhetorical position after the fact to say, oh, look, I claimed that. I predicted that. Um, they're, 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 there, 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 there were lots of people, for example, prior to the invasion of Iraq, who offered very complex, nuanced analyses, saying that they, they were sympathetic to the concerns about weapons of mass destruction, but they were very concerned about the sectarian violence that would arise in Iraq, and very concerned about Iran. And they, they, offered, they offered many layers of nuance. Very, very few of them offered extreme probabilities. Very mm -hmm. few said, this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. They were hedging their bets. Uh, they, they didn't really know what kind, they, they knew, knew that some kind of Shiite leadership would, em would emerge in Iraq, but they didn't know the nature of that leadership, whether, whether it would simply be a mask for sectarian violence or whether it would be um, uh, uh, whether it would, the, the, the Neil Wilsonian dreams of people like Charles Krauthammer would <laughs> well, be, be realized. Here you've been, Iraq's pretty good. This is a live case for all of us. Uh, it counts. I mean, people dying everywhere and uh, politics in America hanging in the balance and all the rest of it. So you've been studying the various forms of expertise that have been holding forth about what will play out in Iraq. And people are voting here and elsewhere on what they think about what will play out in Iraq and how to get to perhaps a desired uh, state. From your foxy point of view, how would you spell out the way things might go in Iraq over the next, say, five years. Now, you bear in mind, I'm a psychologist. <laughs> so I observe the observers. <laughs> and I, I made it a, a strict policy for 20 years not to make predictions <laughs> of my own. Okay, but you've been listening to a number of experts, some of whom you have reason to disbelieve and some of you have reason to believe. And based yeah. on that, without your judgment coming into, into a play here... <laughs> Who has persuaded you how things might go in Iraq? No, not who, but you know, what, what were the persuasive stands from the foxes that you've been listening to? Um, it's hard. Uh, let, me, let me just think for a second here. Um, That's fair. This is not the National Intelligence Council. You can you know, actually sort of wing it. Yeah, no, I... I know. I, 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 I understand my opinions are inconsequential, but <laughs> I, um, I would. I think that this is a situation in which um, the regional experts have done really well. Um, the Bush administration, I think, pretty much decided to ignore. Uh, most Arabists and Middle Eastern experts when they made this uh, choice. Mm -hmm. um, and in, uh, you know, as you know from my data, the regionalists often get it wrong. Mm -hmm. But this is a situation where the regionalists got it right. Um, and the, and the regionalists that you're listening to are saying what now? The consequences have been horrific. Um, mm -hmm. Going forward, what do they say? Um, you know, that. They, 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 they really do hedge. The foxes hedge. Mm. <laughs> they, they, they hedge a lot. And, and, and I, I think that the, the modal view right now is that um, the bloodshed is going to get uh, significantly worse and there, 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 there's, a, there's a spiral of violence, violence that's going to be very, very difficult to contain and that uh, partition is probably uh, the, the, on, the only way to deal with that situation. There, there are very few people who think that uh, an, an Iraqi national unity government will be possible at this point. But characteristic of Fox is that not, I, I don't think they're staying zero. They're not saying, like Robert mm -hmm. Gates, take it off the table. Now, mm -hmm. is, is that a sign that they're just intellectual cowards or is it a sign that they actually have a degree of intellectual imagination and can imagine that somehow it, it could be pulled out of the fire even at this very late stage? 
Um, that's a value judgment I'll leave to the audience. To pursue that a little bit with the, re the regionalists saying partition might be how it comes out, uh, to the way they spell that out with this kind of specificity that foxes are often good at with the howevers, that it occurs of itself, or is it something that needs to be the result of actual policy by uh, heavy-handed players like us? I think they believe it is occurring by itself right now in a, in a, in a particularly brutal way, and the significant parts of Baghdad have been have been de facto partitioned, um, and that uh, but that there may be of the view that uh, U.S. and the Iraqi central government forces should uh, take a more active role in in, in speeding that process up. Um, the Kurds have already mm -hmm. essentially partitioned themselves off, and and really that it's an issue of Baghdad primarily. So some Which of the joining areas. raises then a further question, do these regionalists, uh, again with the heavy-handed players in the game, including us, uh, if this thing is arising somewhat of its own, is the intelligent thing to sort of step out of its way, to ease it into existence with minimum pain and bloodshed, uh, to pretend we don't want it so they're proud when they make it on their own? Mm -hmm. Or, or what? Well, you know, one of the interesting things I, 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 the, I, I after, after the U.S. went into Iraq, I mean, the regionalists were, I would say, 85 to 90 percent against the, 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 the doing this. The people who had regional expertise, that had, had language and cultural knowledge, detailed knowledge of the area, were overwhelmingly against it, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but once the, once the U.S. was in, uh, very few were in favor of an early withdrawal. Mm -hmm. And even now, I don't, I don't, I don't see a lot of support for for an early withdrawal. I, I don't see any optimism that the, the surge mm -hmm. is is going to work. But I, 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 I don't see a lot of. It's it's as though the uh, the yeah. Once you've gone down that path, mm -hmm. uh, the conceptual and ideological disagreements washed out among mm -hmm. them. Uh, there, there, there are there are a few who think that, that the situation is so is so bad, and that the Iraqi central government is so bad that you really do have to get out now, and that we're we're, we're there's a sunk cost fallacy, mm -hmm. that we're 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 spending the lives and money after just to recoup uh, prestige and position, uh, but. Um, well, thank you yeah. for going through that exercise with us. And that's this that's is a, a reminder, <laughs> this is, you know, Paul, this is good scholarship and academic research in progress. These are not academic questions. And uh, these are really fateful things that uh, the hedgehogs, the foxes, and us voters, and everybody else is in the thick of sorting out. And any forms of thinking that uh, are more predictive and are more self-critical and are more adaptive strike me as uh, a way to go, and we just learned how to do it tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.